So we are now on the third piece of the second census lecture. We're on, going on to vision and the receptor, the functional classification for those receptors, the rods and the cones, they would be photoreceptors because they respond to photons of light, which are basically little light packets. Let's start, let's start with sort of a cross section through the eye. So if you take the eye and you do down the sagittal section, that's what we're looking at right here, you're going to see three layers. Okay, so the, the outermost layer that is mostly going to be made up by the sclera. And when you look in the eye, the white part of the eye, that is the sclera that makes, it's like a tough fibrous outer layer that makes up the kind of structure of the wall. And then the sclera in the front, in the anterior part of the sclera, it changes into a different structure, which is called the cornea. So the sclera would be white and the cornea would be clear. And that cornea is going to cover just the front part of the eye. And then the middle layer here would be the choroid. And the choroid is the vascular layer that's gonna have blood vessels in it. And that's gonna help provide nutrients and oxygen for the cells in the sclera and also for the retina because both of those are avascularized, they avascularized which means they don't have any blood vessels. So this middle layer here would be this choroid. And then in the front, the choroid would be continuous with or become the ciliary body, which is this part right here that's gonna hold on the lens. And then in front of that, it would become the iris. So the choroid becomes the ciliary body, then becomes the iris in the front. And then in the, la the last layer would be the retina, which is shown with yellow right here. And the retina is only going to be found in the posterior segment of the eye, the back chamber, the back part of the eye, and it is not continuous with anything in the front. So the retina is just the piece around on the back here. Okay, so now we're gonna go through the different cavities in the eye. There are two general place, two general cavities. You have the anterior segment and then the posterior segment. The anterior segment is then further divided into the anterior chamber and then again into the posterior chamber. So be careful though, because you can have the posterior chamber, that's part of the anterior segment, not the posterior segment. That's confusing to some people. Okay, so looking at the anterior chamber. The, different, the boundary between the two segments is going to be the lens. So anything in front of the lens or anterior to the lens, that would be the anterior segment. And then, then that anterior segment, again, is, has two subdivisions. You have the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, both of which are part of the anterior segment. The boundary between those two chambers is going to be the iris. Okay, so this area from right here that's between the cornea and the iris, that would be the anterior chamber. And then between the iris and the lens, this would be the posterior chamber. Now the entire segment, so both anterior and posterior chambers, they are going to be filled with a fluid and that fluid is called the aqueous humor, aqueous as in watery. Okay, so what does aqueous mean? Watery. And uh, it really is watery. So if you ever had the opportunity to dissect an eye, which unfortunately we don't anymore, you would see just this watery fluid just sort of leaking out from the front. That's the aqueous humor. So the aqueous humor found in the anterior chamber in front of the lens. Okay. Oh, and again, just a reminder, be careful. The posterior chamber is part of the anterior segment, not the posterior segment. Let's look at that iris. So again, when you look at the eye here, the, the white part of the eye is the sclera, but the color part of the eye, that would be the iris. And then in the iris, you have a dark circle, and that dark circle is the pupil, but the pupil is not a structure. What it is is a hole. So the pupil is the hole in the iris. So why do you think that the pupil is black? What's inside that eye? 
no light. There's no light inside of the eyeball. So the pupil is black just because it's dark inside of the eye. That's it. Okay, so the function of the iris is to control the amount of light entering the eye to help um, make sure that those photoreceptors that are found on the back of the eye are well protected from too much light. Okay, so in dim light, they're going to they're going to relax open and dilate. Dilate means make the diameter bigger. And then in brighter light, they're going to constrict and make it smaller. Again, again, that just helps protect those photoreceptors in the back. Do you remember the cranial nerve that controls the pupil size? Starts with an O, ocular motor nerve. Okay, so ocular motor nerve, remember that one's the one that does a whole bunch of st stuff. The ocular motor nerve, it controls most of the extrinsic eye muscles and it also controls the size of the pupil or the size of the, the pupil and the iris. Okay, let's talk a little bit about eye color. So what, again, eye color is iris color. And even in its, it's the color of the eye comes from the amount of melanin in the iris. Now, most of us have heard of melanin before when we think about, remember, the skin, and we kind of think of, yes, just skin color, but really you have the same melanocytes in your iris as you do in your, in your epidermis. And so the melanocytes, they produce melanin, which is the dark pigment. And there actually are two different colors of melanin. You have one that's more of a, like an orangey color and one that is more of a brownish color. And so you, the different combinations and the degree of melanin, the amount of melanin that is found in those eyes, that's gonna give you your eye color. So for example, blue, blue eyes mean they just have less of both types of melanin. The hazel eyes would be sort of a combination of brown and also the orangey color of melanin. And then the darker the eye, the more melanin it has. Okay, so you, they all, so all, all eyes have the same melanocytes. Those are the cells. And so what would vary is the type and the amount of melanin produced. Okay, on to the lens. Okay, so if we're looking at this picture, we're just looking at the anterior segment. So in front of the lens, this right here would be the cornea. Remember that's the clear covering that's in front of the iris. And then behind here, we have, there's the iris right there. It's been cut in half. So you can see the section right there. Behind the iris is the ciliary body, the ciliary body. And the ciliary body has two parts to it. It has the ciliary muscles that contract or relax. They make a sphincter. And then it has the ciliary zonules, which are these little fi filaments here. And what the zonules do is they attach the lens to the ciliary muscles. And so what happens is in order to focus light onto the retina to make the, sure that your, your vision is sharp, what the muscles do is they constrict or relax in order to, to stretch the lens out or let it round up. And the amount of how round the lens is makes it so that the light is going to bend differently and that's going to help focus the light onto the retina so that you get a sharp image. Okay, so the whole thing, all of it collectively together would be the ciliary body. And within the ciliary body, you have the ciliary muscles and then you have the ciliary zonules which connect and hold onto the lens and keep the lens in place and change the shape of the lens. Okay, on to the posterior segment, the posterior behind the lens. The fluid in the posterior segment is made up of a very different type of fluid. It's very thick and jelly-like, and if you open up, what we're looking at in this picture here is if you take a cow eye and you remove the anterior segment from it, what you see is this very thick jello-like material. That's called vitreous humor, vitreous as in viscous, as in thick. So the entire posterior segment of the eye is going to be filled with that vitreous humor. And what that vitreous humor does is it helps create the proper amount of pressure to keep the retina nice and flat and secured to the inside chamber of the posterior segment. 
Okay, so if you ever have a detached retina, those retinas are actually pretty delicate. And so that vitreous humor helps keep it nice and secured up against the choroid underneath it. Okay, so we're looking at the posterior segment. Remember the sclera is the outside, that's the white, tough white, outer white part. The choroid is the middle layer and the retina is on the, on the inside and the retina is where you're gonna find those photoreceptors. So let's look at those photoreceptors. For the retina, it's sometimes referred to as your neural layer because it has uh, three different types of neurons. The receptors, so the photoreceptors that actually respond to light, those are um, the most interior ones. So if we look at right here, so the, the, the photoreceptors would be the ones right up against the choroid, most internal ones. And then on top of those, we have the bipolar cells, bipolar, why do you think they're called that? Look at them. One, two pieces coming off of this, the cell body. These are the structural classification of these neurons are bipolar. That's where their name comes from. And then the bipolar cells are then gonna synapse with the ganglion cells. So if you really think about this, this is kind of bizarre. Think about what has to happen and for you to, or, to perceive the light. The light has to come through the cornea, through the pupil, through the lens, all the way through that vitre vitreous humor. Then it has to go all the way through the ganglion, through the bipolar cells, then activate the photoreceptors, and then the signal going to the brain is gonna come from the, the photoreceptors, those are the rods and the cones, those gonna synapse with the bipolar cells, then the bipolar cells are gonna synapse with the ganglion cells, and then all the axons from those ganglion cells are gonna to come together to create the optic nerve, and then the optic nerve will take it all the way to the brain, right? So it, it's going to, it, the light goes all the way in, and then the signal, the electrical signal comes all the way back out. Okay, so let's look at those rods and cones a little bit. So looking at this picture right here, why do you think this one's called the cone? Why do you think this one's called the rod? So it has to do with the shape of the outer segment. So here is the full neuron right here. There's the cell body right there. They have the inner segment and then the outer segment. And if you look at an um, electron microscope picture of them, they really do look like this. So you have the, the rods are look like cylinders and the cones are cone shaped. So that's where their name comes from. And in these outer segments, what they have are stacks and stacks and stacks of photopigments. And so what happens is those are the what are going to create the electrical signal that then activates that um, activates the rod or the cone to, to so that you can sense the light. Okay, so let's briefly look at the functional differences between rods and cones. I don't want to go into these too much because if you do go into physiology, that will be more along that, you know, more physiology's road. But let's just look at it briefly. The biggest thing I want you to understand is that when you're thinking about color vision, color vision is only gonna be through the cones. So you have three different types of cones and each one of those different types of cones is going to activate at a slightly different um, wavelength of light. Right? So you've got red cones, green cones, and blue cones. And so all of the other different type, the other colors that you're able to perceive, what it is is a pattern of activation where you activate more than one type at a time, and that'll give you, so for example, yellow, right? For, if you're looking at something that's yellow, you'll activate both the green cone and the red cone, and that'll be right here in the middle, and that'll be interpreted as yellow. But if you look at for the rods, the rods are only one type and they don't, they're just black and white. So that's why in the nighttime, by the way, um, rods are good for low level. So um, cones work only work in bright level, bright light. Rods look, work in dim light. And so at nighttime, when you, there's not very much light, it's, you don't really see color. If you really think about it, you're not really seeing color. And that's because the rods don't do color, but they're very, very extra sensitive. And so they're going to be for low light. 
So cones are for bright light and they give you color. They're also involved in visual acuity, making image look sharp, but the rods are really good for low light. Okay, so let's look at a couple of um, terms we need to know. So what we're looking at right now is if you were to, sometimes if you go to the doctor and they dilate your pupil, that allows them to see into the posterior segment of the eye so they can look at the health of your retina. Something that you should do occasionally, make sure it's okay. So this is generally what they would see. So if you're looking at this picture here, so you have the retina here, this right here is called, this area, whole area here is the um, macula luta, macula I means spot, luta is yellow, and what that is is your central vision, and in the middle of the macula luta that you have a pit, a little divot, and that's called the fovea centralis. Fovea means pit, centralis as in central, so the central pit, and the thing I'd like you to understand is this is how you get a lot of good visual acuity because in the fovea centralis, that's where, um, that's the, in that location, you only have cones. And because cones are really, really good at distinguishing points of light, they have very good resolution. And so that's why your central vision is much sharper than your peripheral vision. So that when the lens is focusing the light, it's going to focus the light onto the fovea centralis and that's how you get the best, um, sharpest vision. So the, the fovea centralis is this central pit here. The other term I want you to know is the optic disc. The optic disc is this, is this place right in front of where your optic nerve exits. Okay, so remember the axons from all of those ganglion cells are going to come together to form the optic nerve. Then the optic nerve has to exit the back of the eye. And the place where it exits, that's the optic disc. And the optic disc is also known as the blind spot because in that location, you're not going to have any photoreceptors in that spot. Okay, so that's the, the, the blind spot is the optic disc, that's where the nerve exits the eyeball, okay? So just real quick, just because I find it interesting. So if we have a spot in our, in our retina that, do, that does not have any photoreceptors, why do we not see any blank holes in our field of vision? It's your brain, right? Your brain is gonna fill in those holes. So think about that when you think about perception. Okay, so there is your optic disc. Again, optic disc, no photoreceptors, the blind spot. Optic nerve is going to be those axons taking the visual information to the brain. So let's look at that pathway. Here are the eyeballs. Again, all of the uh, ganglion cells are gonna create the optic nerves. The optic nerves then exit from the back of the eyeball. They're gonna travel. So remember when we talked about the central nervous system, how you have the two cerebral hemispheres and that each cerebral hemisphere sort of controls and, and brings in information from the opposite side. So the visual information from this eyeball is gonna travel to the opposite cerebral hemisphere. And that means it needs to cross and the place that it crosses is called the optic chiasma. So remember, chiasma means cross. So the optic chiasma is the location right here. So we have the two uh, optic nerves coming in. There's the optic chiasma. And then coming out would now be the optic tract. Okay, so we have the optic tract. So just to review, a nerve is part of the peripheral nervous system. And a tract is now part of the central nervous system. Okay, so now part of the brain. The optic tract is gonna take that information to the thalamus. And then remember the function of the thalamus is to filter through the information and then sort it to the correct location. And so the thalamus will be like, well, this is optic information. This is visual information. I'm going to send it to the visual cortex. And so it'll go to the visual cortex. And that is the first location where you actually perceive or are aware of that sensory information in the visual cortex, which is located right here in the occipital lobe. Okay, so let's do a quick review. I think that it would be a good idea to go ahead and pause it real quick, and then I'll go through it with you together.
Okay, so what was the name of that jelly-like fluid that fills the posterior segment? So in the front, you have the watery one, which is the aqueous humor. What's in the back? Starts with a V. Vitreous humor. Which structure controls the amount of light? So it's going to constrict or dilate. That would be the iris. All the axons from which cells? Okay, so remember you've got the photoreceptors, they talk to the bipolar cells, or I should say synapse, the bipolar cells and synapse with the ganglion cells, and then all of those axons come together to form the optic nerve, which then exits from the back of the eye. What's the name? So here we have the sclera. What's the name of the clear structure that's found just in front of the iris in the very, very anterior part of the eye? That would be called the cornea. Cornea. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it and do a new video to talk about the accessory organs.